Good morning. Good morning and welcome to By Grace Community Church. My name is Nathaniel Matthews. I have the honor of serving on the diaconate here. We're going to begin with the call to worship because that's how everything began. This whole thing got started when God said and God said and God said six times. It should come to us as no surprise that when God started laying out the order of service for the tabernacle and then later the temple, it starts with a call to worship and therefore it should be no surprise since we're not making anything up up here. We're patterning it all off of what God's already given us that we are also going to start with a call to worship. So we're going uh, month by month. So you guys have already heard this one. So please stand as you are able. It's a call and response. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the cords of shale entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. For this, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this good day. It is good because you made it, and it is even better because it is Lord's Day, and we are here to worship you and your house with your people, asking for your blessings upon us, for we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Come, care for us, make us more like your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, one quick, um, one quick uh, church interpreting I'll do for you really quick. Diaconate means the group of deacons, in case you didn't know. So when he says he serves on the diaconate, I don't think that happens. Um, but we are. We are here to praise. We are here to worship. And we invite you to join us as we sing.
Welcome once again to By Grace Community Church. If you are a, we're going to do announcements now. Uh, if you are a first time guest, please pick up uh, one of the welcome bags that are out there on the table. Um, I uh, successfully restrained myself from calling them swag bags, but then again, I guess I just didn't. Um, but anyway, um, please uh, pick one of those up, say hello, uh, say hello to me if nobody else says hello to you. Um, which they won't. They'll say hello. Uh, as a uh, reminder, it's been great to see some of the, uh, it's been great to see the reflections on 1 Samuel uh, popping up on the realm. Uh, that is not a uh, time-gated offer. If you, if you still uh, have not put something up and you want to, uh, please, absolutely. Uh, some of my favorite dishes are slow-cooked, so if it takes you a little bit of time, I just, I, I want to taste it at the end, all right? <laughs> Men's Bible Study, 19 June, 6 p.m. here at the church team night, 23 June, 6.30-ish. I was told 6.30-ish, uh, post-Meridian. Uh, the Alexanders are having a young adults cookout. That's on 25 Five. June. I had to get the right line. Uh, that's from 1 to 4 p.m. There is an RSVP link on the realm. That's where we do a lot, of our, a lot of our announcements, a lot of our sharing, a lot of our community, and there's a lot of great information out there. If you don't have a Realm account, please get with me or one of the other elders. We will hook you up. Because if you're a young adult, you'll need to RSVP for the Young Adult Cookout at the Alexander's on 25 June from 1 to 4 p.m. All right, Peninsula Rescue Mission uh, is a dear, dear ministry of ours. We've been with them for a long time. We love helping these guys out. This is downtown Newport News. Great ministry does not just provide the 
uh, physical care uh, that these men need, uh, but also very much the spiritual. I've sat in on the chapel services. They are fantastic. Uh, but And we get to serve. There's a whole bunch of folks that get to do it, so we actually only get to do this uh, yeah, once every other month. Is that it? All right, anyway, once every other month. And this next one coming up is 27 June. So that's going to be at uh, 4.45 p.m. Please sign up so that we know we have enough folks. There's a uh, physical sign-up list right out there by the kitchen door. Grays and Games. First, what? What are we? What, annual? Yeah. First annual? We'll see. We'll see. Hey, hey, so, so we're excited. So this is, the, this is like the crowdfunding thing. You know, make sure your interest is known by how much you participate the first time, right? All right, so Grays and Games, 1 July, 3 to 6 p.m., right here at the church. That also has an RSVP sign-up, and that also is on the realm. Yeah, hey. All right, so we've been uh, learning verses this whole year, uh, which has been great, by the way. Uh, so this... Weeks? Is it week? Week long. All right. Well, we go back and we review them, which is fantastic as well. So, but this one here is Micah 6 8. And it says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So, this is Micah, one of the minor prophets, not minor like less important, minor like shorter. Um, and it comes at the end. I'm going to go ahead as we as we move into our uh, our time of congregational prayer. I wanted to read you the uh, the context before this, um, so that you know uh, what it is. Sorry, all my all my uh, all my connect kids know about finding the context when you're when you're looking at a verse. All right, here we go. Micah six one through eight says, "Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains." And let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. Quotes. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Quote, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? End quote. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Let us pray. Almighty God, you are thrice and forever holy. And you have bid us come to you to present our households before you in a holy assembly. We dare not disobey, but we are painfully aware of our sins, those things we have done and those things we have left undone. We are ashamed because we are yours. You have called us and justified us and sanctified us and adopted us, but our sins are not of you. They can't even fit into the reality you've made. So here we find ourselves in this contradictory muck of juxtaposition, entangled in this slew of despair. What do we even do with this? But you, being the great creator who can't do anything by half, being the loving father who provides what you command, being the constant comforter who helps us even with our groanings, you forgive us. You have a place for our sin and our shame a place for our guilt and our guilty feelings, and that place is where Jesus said it is finished. All of it? Even, yes, all of it. 
O mightiest and highest of all gods, maker of heaven and of earth, of all things visible and invisible included, we do indeed assemble in this holy convocation and present ourselves to you as you've commanded to take hold of your knees and to weep onto your feet. Where else can we go? You have the words of life, and you use them to grow in us the conviction that not a single created thing, not angels, not principalities, not powers, not height, not depth, not love, not even death itself, can separate us from your great love. Help us in our unbelief, for Master, we believe. You've called us and we've come. We've brought you our sins and you've forgiven us. Now we bring you our other supplications, knowing that you will give us bread and wine, not stones and scorpions. We ask that you bless our sister congregation at Crosswater Presbyterian down in Chesapeake. Grant great faithfulness and wisdom and energy to their session and diaconate, especially Pastor Curley. Bless their witness and their local community. Grant so much growth that they overflow into daughter churches all around. We thank you for the traveling mercies you constantly grant us when we're driving around Hampton Roads. We ask, especially as we enter this season of travel, that you would keep us from injury, both of bodies and of vehicles. Grant us made connections, on-time departures, and the mildest travel crud we've ever had. Grant us good pillows and unmissed naps. Let the, let the fellowship be sweet and the relationships better and bring us all safely to the journey's appointed end which is all we ever ask. You've said that you will grant us wisdom if we ask it, and so we hereby ask for wisdom. There are all sorts of ways that we will use it. Job and financial decisions, health and treatment choices, where and how to spend our affection, where and how to spend our time, how to serve this church and your people more broadly, how to minister to our countrymen and those not yet counted among your people. Let our counsel to each other be steeped in your ways and your character. Let our words and ways smell like you. Let our love be what we're known for. Bless now the rest of this service. Bless us all through Pastor Kevin's words in this sermon, and don't forget him too. In Jesus' name, amen. Time. Children through second grade are dismissed for Children's Church. Please head out the double doors and your teacher, teachers will meet you in the lobby. And as they continue their worship out there, we will continue worshiping in here through song and also by the giving of God's tithes and our offerings. So we invite you to stand at this time.
please be seated. tell you before we get to the scripture I just need you to know how awesome it is to pastor a church that sings yes. like you do Amen. large array of our worship team here this morning and I heard y'all more than I heard them Jeremy thank you church thank you if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open up to Galatians chapter 1. We're engaged in a sermon series going ever so slowly through Galatians, verse by verse. And we're going to continue that journey with verses 2 through 5 of chapter 1. This is God's Word. May it flourish in the hearts of all His people. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. And all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would meet with us. We, as your people, delight in your word because it enables us to delight in you, to delight in your character, to delight in your kindness. Father, we ask this morning that you would meet with us, that you would help us to see clearly, to hear rightly, that we might judge truly and righteously. Father, we also ask that as you draw near to us and we draw near to you, would you bring hope where fear lives? Would you bring rest where weariness reigns? And would you bring healing to those who need encouragement and strength? Lord, we are a dependent people who delight to sing your praises. Come and give us of your spirit that we would be strengthened and renewed and prepared for all that you have for us but may we chiefly delight in you this morning and all day and all week, even all year. For the span of our lives, may we delight in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people agree. Amen. <laughs> trophies. You guys like trophies? You guys remember trophies? I think my athletes among us will have a favorite trophy, a favorite plaque, a favorite remembrance. They're like tiny little Ebenezers, right? Tiny little reminders of achievement and success. And then, if you really want to upset 20 and 30-year-olds... Tell them that they got too many of these. <laughs> that showing up isn't worth that beautiful ribbon you receive. Where is it? Trophies should be earned, yes? Participation is not nothing, yes? Oh, I got you riled up this morning. All I got to do is head towards your pride and you are awake. The attack of pride, the swell of pride, greater than any coffee you can drink. 
remembering the immortal words of a cartoon character in a bygone movie who said, if everyone is special, then no one is. Do you remember Dash? If everyone is special, then no one is. How can you be more right and more wrong at the same time? Trophies for all. Trophies should be earned. What if someone earned the trophy and gave it to you? What if someone else is the all-star that he invites you into the sharing of his successes, his victories, yours. The gospel is hard sometimes. It's easy, often, easy to neglect or grow numb to perhaps, or easy to cherish and cling to. But when we think about the gospel, there is always an attack on our pride that tells us we do not win the prize by our merits. And yet, we do have trophy. We do have the glory of victory. Do we not? We share in all that is Christ's as Christ has shared all in our losses, our failures and shames. Sometimes the book of Galatians is a slayer of pride. And sometimes it is a salve for the soul. Does our pride need killing only once? Does our soul need comfort merely once? And yet both of those ongoing activities have a single basis. The life and death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ as the resurrected Christ gives you his spirit. So in one sense, everyone is special because we share in the specialness of Christ. And in another sense, only Jesus has scored this victory. Only he has been the obedient covenant-keeping son. So Dash is right. And Dash is incomplete to represent all that is true in the gospel. And that's what we're going after, y'all. What we are going after in the time we spend together in this letter that Paul has written to the churches of Galatia, we are asking questions about what is commendable and what is condemnable. To what do we commend? To what do we, or more importantly, does God condemn? As we have seen, the Apostle Paul begins with his authority, the basis upon which he has the right to give guidance to the church. It is, of course, his status as a unique and necessary emissary. He is a man filled with authority that didn't come from other men. It came from God and was given to him directly by God. Last week when I talked about the fact that Jesus was the channel of his calling, I mean he's the delivery agent. He's the one 
who called Paul. Ministers have a calling that comes from God, but it comes by other mediation, by a presbytery or a church. Paul has his status from the mind of God given to him directly, not indirectly like me. And so Paul is riled up, we will see in the coming weeks, and he wants to establish his authority from the jump, from the very beginning. He is not speaking man's words contrived and designed over time by a group of men who would die for a lie. Instead, he has seen the risen Christ. Count him among the 500 or so. Paul begins in verse 1 with the resurrection. This isn't normally how the gospel begins, right? When we give the gospel, don't we usually begin at least between crucifixion and resurrection? Do we not usually start with crucifixion? But he starts with resurrection. Why? Because it's the risen Christ who called him. So what is juxtaposed in our understanding of the events of human history is for Paul actually a model of faith in this age. That you would meet the risen Christ through the testimony of his word and then understand the true and deepest meanings of the crucifixion. So here Paul begins with the resurrected Christ So it's clear now that he is the author, that the message comes from God. And now we ask the question, to whom is this message to be given? But he doesn't jump to that yet. There's this curious introduction in the beginning of verse 2. He's talking about the resurrected Christ, and then all of a sudden, he says, and all the brothers who are with me. Wait, did Paul form a council to write this letter? Are these words not Paul's alone? Is there a committee? We're Presbyterians, we love committees. Hang on, we need committees? Don't always love them. Is this a joint venture? No, it's not. What is Paul saying here? As Paul approaches the gospel and seeks to share with them what's going on, what the introduction is all about, what he is saying is that the brethren who are with him join in what he's saying. You catch that? They're not authors, they're agreeers. In fact, sometimes people think that this and all the brothers with me is just a a, a really quick greeting where Paul's like, hey Eunice, been a while. What's up guys? I got a whole church with me and they all say hi to you. But when Paul wants to do that, where does it come in his letters? It's always at the end. Is he changing it up here? No. Has he changed his mind later about how to do this? No. He wants the Galatians to hear the unity of the gospel, the unity of the true faith. So in other words, he's saying all the brethren who are with me join in what I'm saying to you And then there's a pregnant question. It's implied, it's not stated, but I think as you follow the tone and progression of the letter, you will see it. There's this implied question. Will you agree with and share in these glorious truths with us? That's really the question that's happening here. When Paul reminds them that he is not an isolated preacher 
with his own ideas as he creates a new religion. How many times have you heard someone say that Paul is a corruption of Jesus? If you have not heard that thought, count yourself blessed. The brethren who are with him. And by the way, this word brethren, it doesn't mean men only. It's not gender exclusive. It means, and all the brothers and sisters who are with me. Adelphoi is the Greek word. In other words, there are men There are women, there are children who gather together in the joyous agreement that the gospel is true. And that's where the implication comes. Will you agree? Will you share in these glorious truths with us? I commend you at the outset for being a singing church for being men and women and children who lift their chins and voices to celebrate the victory of God in his character and goodness, his wisdom and his power. We too desire that more would know. Yes? That more would remember that those who think they know but don't would, and that those who never heard would not only hear, but receive. So Paul and the, and the brethren, the brothers and sisters who are with him, are speaking a word. They're speaking truth. That's why it's an epistle. It deals in the realm of truth. And as we've seen from Machen, we cannot delve into the realm of truth without also exposing and removing error. So, Paul's writing, he's doing so in the agreement of the church, not just a single church or a local church, but the church. And he's directing a message. To whom is this word given? The answer is simply in verse 2, second half, it's simply written to the churches of Galatia. Well, for a long winded fella, that's pretty quick. That's really concise. Way to go, Paul. Or maybe there's a little more going on, and you know me well enough to know that I know that you know that I know that there's more going on. We can see instantly the brevity of his address. To whom is this given? The churches of Galatia. But also notice the formality. It's not one church. It's a grouping of churches. It's not one bad teacher that Paul will be writing this word of warning against. There will be groups of false teachers, pluralities of them, who've infested and invaded the church of God. The other thing worth noticing in this brevity and in this formality is that there are no words of commendation. Paul has no stickers to give, no plaques to mount, no trophies to provide. And in fact, he has no intention of commending them. In fact, I don't know that he knows that they are real believers. Having been there and planted the church and worked among them, Paul sees the severity of the issue that they are in danger of falling away. Not that they might lose their salvation, but that they might lose the gospel of salvation, the good news of God's grace 
towards us. Paul takes very seriously the errors infesting these churches. Is Paul loud and mean because he hates them? Every father knows the difference between righteous anger and the other forms. This is a letter of righteous anger. This is not an act of cruelty. Paul does not seek to demean the people in that place, but he does not give them a word of commendation. Listen to the opening of the letter to the church in Rome, okay? You don't have to turn there. It'll come up on the screens. Romans 1, verse 7. Listen to Paul's intro here. Who is this letter written to? It's written to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Well, that's pretty cool. He goes on, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That'll sound familiar in a minute. Or consider how he opens his letter to the church in Corinth. And believe me when I tell you that is a messed up church. Praise God, because it means the gospel's for messed up people. But listen to how he opens this address. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those in every place who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Let's go one more place, and I think I've made the point. Philippians 1, second half of verse 1 into verse 2, we read, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at the city of Philippi. Now, if you had a choice between Romans and 1 Corinthians and Philippians as the greeting to you, would you rather have any one of those three than this one in Galatians? If Paul's being brief, we need to be nervous. In all of these, there's an implied church, not just by outward organization, but by inward exaltation. Those who are loved by God, called to be saints, or those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, or to the saints in Christ, you get this union with Christ language at the beginning of these other letters. So clearly, the Galatian churches, plural, Paul's not ready to put a stamp of faith on them yet. Does that mean the gospel has a knowledge bar that you must achieve or a works bar that you must triumph over? May it be anathema for us to do such a thing. Paul's writing this letter that those who hear it and receive it would reject the error and allure of legalism. May they reject The error, that's usually a mental deal, right? But also the allure, the heart realities of legalistic religion. Make no mistake, my house requires this too. Remembering that the gospel is for recovering Pharisees. We raise them because God calls us and then we want them to lead and follow into the glories of what we do and somehow, who knows, maybe human pride, 
they begin to think it's their achievement that makes them welcome. It's their willingness to dress different, be different, stand up when others sit, fight back when others push, speak when others shout. They might think that's what makes them different. I do the right thing in a world of people doing the wrong thing. Clearly, God has an affection for me that is greater than the affection he could have for others. So sometimes we dress this legalism up in historic terms. We use groupings like, or titles like, the Judaizers. Well, do you want to be a Judaizer or do you want to be a Christian? Uh, Pastor, I need to know the difference real quick. I'm not ready to vote. Who are these Judaizers? Why is Paul beginning with his credentials? What does Paul's resume have to do with the letter he's writing to people he's known for years? Because error, because falsehood, because deception and lies have infiltrated these churches. Paul is going to come hard and strong, fast, And unequivocal, they must reject the error and the allure of Christianity as a performance religion. So I ask you, why does God love you? Why does God grant you repentance? Why does God give you faith? regenerating your heart so that you could love what you despised, so that you could cling to that which you would otherwise run from. The Judaizers are called that because they are requiring the Gentiles, these outsiders to Judaism, they're requiring these Gentile believers to obey Jewish customs in order to have a right standing with God. R-S-W-G. Right standing with God. So they have a formula in their gospel. It's very clear, and I'll show it to you. But hear what it is so that you can recognize it as it is read to you. Their quote gospel, and believe me, this is not good news. There is no good news here. Only tyranny reigns. The tyranny of self and the dominion of death. This is their formula. Their gospel, quote unquote, was Jesus Christ. Good, I'm glad he's in there plus the law of Moses. That's what gives you RSWG. Right standing with God. Their answer to the question, why is God pleased with you, is I need some of Jesus and I need my own obedience and performance according to the standards of God and the word of God, the law of God. There's a whole lot of God in that follow-up variable, yes? Jesus Christ plus me equals right standing with God. That's the formula. It'll get changed and glamorized and mutated in different forms throughout all of human history, this has been true. We have been born with an inherent self-righteousness, a desire to be loved just as I am without any need to change. That's literally the description of like 98% of romance pop music, yes? Yes? You can have Bruno Mars playing instantly if you start 
humming any phrase along those lines, right? Oh, baby, don't change. And let's spend some time together. Jesus Christ plus anything is not the gospel. So, let's hear the Judaizers and have their idea represented in this formal council of Jerusalem. If you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15, we're going to look at just the first verse and the fifth verse, and I'd encourage you to spend some time in this chapter this week on your own. But for time's sake, I'm just going to do the first verse and the fifth verse. Council in Jerusalem has met together. This is Peter and James. This is Paul and the other disciples, apostles, elders. They've met together to discuss the gospel. How much of the old stays with the new? Here's their idea. Verse 1, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be, what? Can't be saved. Whoa. They followed up, verse 5. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary, that's a must, it is necessary to circumcise them and order them, that's a command again, to keep the law of Moses. Jesus declared all foods clean in Mark 7. So, In order to keep the law of Moses, do these Gentile believers have to now adopt Jewish practices and customs surrounding food laws? That is the demand of the Judaizers. That's why we call them Judaizers. They are exalting the Judean heritage. In other words, if you want to be a real Christian, your real Christian beliefs have to come inside and be covered by Judaism. You're not really a Christian. You're like a later generation outsider come insider Jew. So I ask you, is their gospel true? Must we add to Christ to be right with God? Are the Judaizers correct, or is this a gross and terrible attempt at a gospel? Is this slavery repackaged to look more presentable in their day? We have to do something with Jesus. After all, he's the talk of the town. Best prophet we've had in years. Excuse me, God, sort of. Right? Isn't that, I mean, like, can you imagine the disconnect in the minds of the Judaizers? Jesus is God. Be Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. Be Jewish. Jewish is good. Performance is good. Or maybe it's death. Listen to the Apostle Paul talk later in that chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He's going to tell that hilariously messed up church, which should be a comfort to all us non-Pharisees. We ragamuffin failures. May we hear Paul's words and scream hallelujah. This is the gospel that Paul wants the Galatians to believe. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance, no importance greater, what I also received. Who do you receive it from? 
According to Galatians 1, 1, he got it from God. He didn't get it from Peter or Luke or Barnabas. He got it from God. So he delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Here it is. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. There's your gospel. Crucifixion and resurrection. Crucifixion and resurrection. A bloody cross and an empty tomb. All in accordance with the Scripture. The Word of God. So if we turn our eyes back to Galatians... Paul has been curt in his address of them. He has not commended them in any way. He hasn't said, hey, I'm so grateful for you guys. I love you guys. All the prayers and the money and all that stuff that you do for the kingdom. I love it. Keep doing it. There's no praise at the beginning of Galatians. There's no claim or expectation of perfect unity and fellowship. But there is blessing at the beginning of Galatians. There is a a good word at the beginning. In fact, I've used this many times in the life of our church as a benediction. Do you know what a benediction is? It's not just this part of a worship ceremony that we do. A benediction, two words... Come together, bena, good, diction, words. It's where we get the idea of a dictionary. It's a book of words. Paul begins Galatians with a benediction. With a summary of truth designed to bless them. He's attacking error not by character assassination, but by truth. This is Paul using the sword of the Spirit for its most important use. Think about Ephesians 6 for just a second. All the armor is defensive, right? The belt and the brace plate, breastplate and the helmet. The right shoes. They're defensive. You run away or you stand. Only offensive weapon we've ever been given and entrusted with. It's the sword of the Spirit. Where the sword of the Spirit slays pride, the salve of the gospel heals soul. That's how this works. So listen to this good word. Hear this good word. Let it ring in your bones the truth of this. Paul speaks to them and says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You hear it? This is also what he says in these other openings. After he commends these other churches like Romans 1. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Those sound pretty similar, yes? Yes. To, To the church in Corinth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's see it in Philippians again. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Is not Paul clinging to the same gospel and then praising the praiseworthy and also, as we will see, confronting not just small error. Sometimes we Reformed and Presbyterian types can be persnickety. I know you're thinking in your heart, no. There's no way you guys are. Yeah, we are. 
Sometimes out of self-righteousness, sometimes out of complete devotion. But the gospel itself is unchanged. Whether it's commended or condemned, it remains the same. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask yourself this week, or perhaps discuss over lunch, how should we define the two words presented here? Grace, what is the best definition of grace? You know, you can think, you could write. And peace, what is biblical peace? And how does it come from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ? But for now, listen to verse 4. Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Y'all, these are the facts. Crucifixion. Resurrection. This is the truth. This is the crucifixion of Christ as payment for sins. How does Christ deliver us? He does so as our substitute. As R.C. Sproul delights to remind us from years ago, we get to sing bloody songs forever. We get to sing bloody songs forever because there is my sin. It is mine no more. There is my shame, my failure, my performance. Isaiah is pretty critical of our abilities. He goes on to say at one point, all your righteous deeds, those are filthy rags. He's not talking about a shop rag with grease on it. That's a rag that holds the flow of a cycle. You with me? That's how God views your righteous deeds. How do you think he views your unrighteous ones? But Christianity is not a performance-based religion in the sense that we find our way to God. We do not make ourselves approvable by Him. The Gospel is not about what you do for God. It is about what God has done for us. These are the facts. This is the truth crucifixion, and if we hear verse 4, we will also see a rescue plan. Excuse me. The rescue plan. This simple summary documents what God has done in history. This is fact. But I ask you, Later today or this week, or maybe every day this week, reread these verses 3, 4, and 5 and ask the question where are your actions? Did, did I hear you do anything there? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're in there, but only as recipients. He delivers us. We're the object of deliverance. We are not the action giver. We are not the performer. The active verbs there don't belong to us. The state of finality 
Y'all, that's ours. That's ours. But this is so weird. When we ask the question, where are our actions? Part of what we are trying to figure out is the question, isn't religion supposed to prescribe the actions you must perform in order to please God? Where is my to-do list? Even if it's a honey-do list. What are you required to do for God to gain His favor, earn His pleasure? How do you get to God? Everybody else has ideas about that. But Jesus says, no, no, no. (laughs) Y'all, you don't get to me. I come to you. You don't perform for me. I have kept for you. I have done all that is necessary. I have earned all the blessings. Those blessings that we glory in that are stored up in the heavenly places, Jesus is the one who put them there. And his spirit is the one who brings them forth in our lives. Listen to J.B. Lightfoot. J.B. Lightfoot says this, the gospel is a rescue. It's an emancipation from a state of bondage. Right? We often think in terms of the gospel as our personal salvific tool. It's about our personal salvation. And that is true. But it is incomplete. It is incomplete in the sense that there is a God-redempting purpose to all of history, all of life. He is the one to deliver us from the present evil age. Did you catch that part? That we're in danger? That that we're trapped in an evil age? Even though, as believers, we continue to live in this evil realm, we are being rescued from it. Do you want to live in this sinful world? Or do you long for the next one where sin and sorrow are removed from everything and every place, including us? The great and glorious truth being presented here, this good word that Paul begins his letter with, is telling us as a rally cry of glory, that the age to come has burst into this age. Let me try that again. The age to come, that someday soon, that and its goodness, its power, it has burst in to our world, to our moment, to human history. Y'all, the end has come to the middle by means of Christ. Do we still live in this realm? Yeah, but we will live here for a tiny whisper of time, a light dew that the sun easily fades away. And we will live forever, forever in the place we are designed to be. Forever and ever. And it might sound like a long time, but it won't feel like a long time. In other words, the age to come has burst into the present age, meaning the destiny of the cosmos. What's the future of the cosmos? (laughs) Peace is the future of the cosmos. Reconciliation is the future of the cosmos. Perfection is the future of the cosmos. Make no mistake, the theological witness of this text is the gospel. Are you commended or condemned? How might the Apostle Paul rate us? 
If we put by grace before him as a church body, what might he say in an address to us? Would he commend us for things? Would he condemn us for things? Would he speak a word of warning to us? Would he believe that we have drifted away from the Bible? From the God of the Bible? You want to make application from today's message. Do it in both ways. Ask questions about personal salvation. Yes, do I believe? Do I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins and was raised according to the scriptures. Is that my testimony? Jesus plus nothing is right standing with God. And that's not just a courtroom thing. That's also an adoption thing. How many times do you think your performance is the deciding factor in alienation between you and God? As if the cross of Christ isn't a secure bridge. Always present. When you think of our church, or maybe the church in our day, our era, do you think we need more empty, pious words? More foolish optimism? Or do you think the church in our day needs more Fearless honesty. Like Paul gives. Do you know how hard it is to not people please? Do you know how good it is to have people fearlessly tell you the truth? Proverbs taught me years ago. The wounds of a friend can be trusted. Enemies multiply kisses. The surgeon comes to remove the cancer that the healthy tissues would live and multiply. So here's my reminder for us. Here's our application. It is not glamorous, but it is necessary. My reminder to you, my urging to you, my commending to you is to remember the gospel. Remember that Jesus plus nothing equals right standing with God. You can't add baptism to your salvation. You can't add righteous works to earn God's favor. So ask the question, the scary question, the humbling question. What am I tempting to add to Christ for vindication, for healing for comfort to solve the problem of alienation between me and God to understand what it is to have a father's love apart from performance do the scary thing and ask what do I rely on in crisis and what is true regardless of my circumstances Ask the Lord to slay your pride with the, with the sword of the Spirit and ask for the salve, the comfort of faith alone. Trust in Christ alone. Remembering that the destiny of the cosmos is peace, reconciliation, And dare I say it, perfection. The gospel is for us, but it ain't about us, y'all. Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that you have not abandoned us to ourselves, that you are with us, that you love us. And thank you that we have grace and peace, not from our performance, not from our rule keeping, but from your obedience. So will you be our trophy? Will you be our treasure? Will you lift yourself up and take down all other idols? 
Treat the, other, uh, treat the idols of my heart like Dagon. Chop their arms off. Cut off their head. That I would worship you only. To the glory and praise of Jesus Christ. Who alone is our Redeemer and Savior. And all God's people agree. We invite those of you who are able to stand as we sing in response. Also at this time, parents, please head to the lobby and pick your children up from Children's Church.
God from Jesus, plus nothing, is right standing with God. Best summary of our personal salvation. Let us also remember that in this plan of rescue and redemption, the deliverance that was given to you for your personal salvation you also have a role to play, not to earn God's favor, but to see His name lifted up and praised. That's the invitation. Receive personal salvation, yes, and take part in this glorious rescue plan. Yes. Amen? Amen. Please stand or remain standing for the benediction comes to us from surprisingly enough, Galatians 1. Hear this word, this good word. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave Himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people agree? Amen. Amen.